Well, good morning, everybody. What a glorious day. What a great day to be in God's house with all of God's people, celebrating, praising Him, giving Him glory and honor. It's just a beautiful day. I'm so happy to be here today. Um, I've, you know, as always, I always struggle with the Word because sometimes what I want to do is not what God has for me to do. So I want to do what God wants me to do and what Word He gives me to give to you guys. So let's just go in prayer first. And Father, I just thank you, Lord. I thank you for this amazing day. I thank you for this opportunity to be your vessel, Father. Just use me. Let the Spirit speak through me. Let these be your words, not mine, Father. And just give me supernatural wisdom to know what it is you'd have me to say and to share with your people today. I just thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So before we get too much further, today is second Sunday, so it's prophetic Sunday. So first, second, third time visitors, we have prophetic rooms open after church. And you can go over, and there's a wooden stand over here, and you can sign up, and we'll call you into a room. It's an amazing experience. If you've never done it, you need to give it a try. It's awesome. It's very encouraging and uplifting, and it will um, put an extra hop in your step as you leave today. Also, I know several people have asked me about the flood relief in Western North Carolina, and um, I'm taking a few things to ambassadors to Charlotte this week. And they actually have a person on the ground up in the mountains where all the relief is going on. So they kind of have an idea about what is needed, where it needs to go. And they're out there in their side-by-sides going to all the different places to help with relief. If you, I've had people ask me about making a monetary donation for that. And I talked with Ina. And if you guys want to do that, the best way to do it is to go online to ambassadors.com and do it through their website. And you can make a memo that is going for the flood relief in Western North Carolina. Every dollar that you give to ambassadors for whatever you give it for goes the 100%. There is no administration fees taken out. There is no processing fees taken out. It is all there. So some organizations have an overhead that they have to pay, and we understand you've got to pay the bills, but all their bills is, pro- is paid for by another source, so your money that you donate goes strictly to what you say it goes to. So if you're wanting to do a monetary, that's the best way to do it. So, as you can see, today I'm talking about why did Jesus die? Why did he die? What did it do? What did it accomplish? And why did he have to die for us? Um, You know, he died for a lot of things. People think, well, you know, because he's on the cross, you know, in Isaiah 53, 5, it talks about by his stripes we are healed, you know, our transgressions, you know, he went to the cross for that, okay? He died for our healing. He died, you know, so that we could spend eternity in heaven with him. You know, those are the, you know, a lot of things, but there's so much more to it, so much more in depth. So Jesus dying on the cross, and this is number one, him dying on the cross removed our sins and our guilt from us. So in John 1, 29, it says, The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So that's John the Baptist talking about Jesus. But he never really, I mean, they were cousins, right? But he never really saw him, but he knew of him. And he recognized him by his spirit and the way he presented himself. And he knew that that was the Lamb of God who was coming. So he died He goes, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So he prophetically and foreshadowed that, you know, he was going to take away the sins of the world. Not just the sins of those who believe on him, but the sins of everybody in the world. Not just me because I believe he died on the cross for me, so he died for my sins. But he didn't die for Sam over here because Sam doesn't believe in God or doesn't believe Jesus died for him. He still died for his sins too. He died for everybody's sin in the world. And 1 John 2, 2, and he is the, now, I got to give you guys a little warning here. I have a hard time saying some words, and you all know what I love to bake, because you guys love it when I bake them and I bring them in. That word I can't say very well. I got to really slow down and think about it. I usually go, but it's, cinnamon rolls okay so this is another word i have an issue with so 
Just bear with me. Propitiation. Okay. Propitiation of our sins, and not for our, ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So again, so I actually was on the phone with Tim. I go, okay, you've got to help me say this word. So we went over and over and over and over it. So now I'm like, well, what does that mean? That's not a word we use in today's language, right? In today's normal conversation, hey, I'm at work, and I'm like, hey, you know, the propitiation of whatever. No, what does it mean? Well, it means satisfied. So he is a satis- satisfaction of our sins. He satisfied the penalty for our sins. He satisfied everything for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So it's in two verses. So that means, I mean, he, the Bible is confirming itself. He died for everybody, not just for the Jews, not just for the Gentiles, not just for the Americans, not just for the Africans, not just for, you know, the Hispanic, not just for, you know, the green people and the purple people. He died for everybody, everybody in the world. In Psalms 103.12, you know, when you sin and you ask for forgiveness, what does he do? As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Him dying for us and we going to him and asking for his forgiveness and asking him into our heart, he takes our sins and he makes them as far as the east is from the west. So I never really thought about that until, you know, I was looking into this. If, I'm, if this is east and I'm walking east and I keep walking east and I keep walking east, am I ever going to hit west? Because I'm always going to be going east. Now, if I'm walking west, I keep walking west, I keep going, am I ever going to hit east? No. So that's how far he's removed the sins from us. It's never, you can never get back to it, right? You, he takes it, he removes it as far as infinity because you're never going to make it back there. So the perfect, so when, back in the olden days when you had, you know, in the, the, you go to the priest, they do the sacrifice, you had to bring something to sacrifice, right? So you bring a lamb, you bring that lamb. Now, if I'm going to sacrifice an animal, I don't want to give it my best, right? Because I want to keep that for myself, right? No. To, they brought their best. It had to be an animal without blemish. So number two, the perfect sacrificial animal was the one that was without blemish. Perfect. So when they brought their sheep or their animal to the priest, and the priest would examine the animal to make sure it was perfect before they could sacrifice it, right? Now, when they're done examining that animal, did they move on and look at the person and be like, Mabel, you know, your, your animal's perfect, but you're not, so I can't accept the sacrifice, right? No, they didn't look at the person. They didn't examine the person to make sure the person was perfect. It didn't matter. They did not inspect them. So the only perfect sacrifice was Jesus. So he's a sacrifice without blemish for us. So you don't have to be perfect. He was. So if you're struggling with something like, well, I'm not good enough. God's not going to be able to use me because, you know, when I was younger, I really messed up. I mean, you know, I was wild and crazy. And I was. I did some wild and crazy things when I was younger. You know, and we won't go into detail because it's too much information. But... But I did some things that would, you would guys would be surprised. But with that being said, God can still use me. I'm not perfect. Nobody in this room is perfect. You know? And I used to think that I couldn't ever, there's no way I can get up there and teach. There's no way I could get up there and, you know, teach like Kimberly does, or Lorraine does, or Pastor Tim, or Pius. There's no way I could get up here and do that because I've messed up so much in my life. I've lied. I've tricked people. I've not been a good influence. You know, I walked down the wrong path in life, you know, and went 
you know, the carnal way instead of the right way. But you know what? You trust in God, and he'll put you back on that path, you know? So praise God that I got over that. I'm not perfect. I am far from perfect. But with Jesus, I can accomplish anything that he wants me to accomplish. So let's look at Isaiah 53, 6, 7. All we like sheep have gone astray. Yeah, I went astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So when he went to the cross, he took everything of the world, everything. But he did it, and he didn't complain. He didn't yell out. He didn't speak out against the people that were doing this to him. He just took it all. So he died on the cross for us, for our sin. You know, but last week I messed up last week, and I sinned again, and I told this little white lie at, ch- at, um, at church, yeah. And then at work again, and it just got worse. Okay, so does he have to go and die again for me? So that's number three. So does he have to go to the cross and die every time I sin, every time we sin? The answer is no. He only needed to die once. And he died once for all our sins, past, present, and future. So, as Pastor Dave used to say, when Christ died, all your sin was future. Because I wasn't there when he died. So, I'm in the future, so all my sin is future. He already paid for it. You know? So, I used to love that. And, you know, your sin, it was already future. It was already paid for before you even were born. So in Hebrews 9.26, He then would have to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. They had to go every year to make their sacrificial lamb. Every year they had to do that. When Jesus came, he was the ultimate sacrifice. For once and for all, it is done. The old law is gone. We're now under the new law. Hebrews 10.10, just just confirming this, by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. In the Passion, it says, by God's will, we have been purified and made holy once and for all through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus, the Messiah. Okay, so what else did Jesus dying on the cross do for us? If you look at, at number four, it says, Jesus dying on the cross removed the punishment that was meant for us and made the only way. So, you know, when you have kids and they do something wrong and you got to punish them and they get, sometimes they get scared, like, don't spank me, mommy, don't spank me, don't spank me, you know, or don't ground me, don't take my phone, you know, as they get older, don't take my car, don't take the internet, you know. When they, when they do something wrong, they have to suffer the consequences, and that's the wrath, the wrath of mom. So in some households, the wrath of mom is worse than the wrath of dad. So in our household, it depended on which, chi- which child it was. The wrath of one child was worth, worse from dad than it was from mom, and vice versa. It's just kind of the way things fall. But because each child is different, and they respond differently to each parent. But, so we had the wrath of God upon us because we are born sin nature. You know, our forefathers sinned, you know, biblical times. I mean, just look at the, look at some of the people in the Bible we look up to. Look at David. Did David sin? Yeah. Did Abraham sin? Did Moses? They all did. So it's just in our nature that we're going to sin. So, We had the wrath. So him dying on the cross removed the wrath of God, which we, we deserve. And instead of it being wrath when he died, it turned that wrath into favor. So now we have favor with God. You know, God already loved us fully, which is the reason he sent Jesus to die. It turned his wrath into favor. 
so that we could realize his love for us and the purpose of that. So in Romans 3, 25 through 26, and here we go again. Whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God has, had passed over the, th- over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So we have faith in Jesus so we can have his righteousness. So again, propiti- propitiation is satisfa- satisfaction. So there's two, another word here, expiation, expiation and propitiation are related. The first means the removal of sin and the guilt that comes with that. So that's one thing he did on the cross. The second, propitiation means satisfaction. He satisfied the wrath. So he died for our sins, and he died for the wrath of God. Um, you know, people say, well, God loves a sinner but hates the sin. You know, and that's true, but what does it really mean? We have to understand it's not just sin that God sends to hell. But the person, unless you have Christ, and you recognize that Christ died for you and rose again, you're going to hell as well. The sin gets thrown to hell, but if you don't repent and go to, come to Christ, you're going to follow that sin to hell. And it's very, very important. You have the right to choose. You know, so on that note, I'm going to flip over here. You know we have 23 days left till the election. 23 days. 23 days to pray each day about how you're going to vote. 23 days to try to listen to what God is telling you how to vote. 23 days to pray for what you're going to do because it's our right to vote. We have a right. In this country, we have rights. We have a lot of rights. Sometimes I think we might have too many rights, (laughs) but we have rights. And you have the right to choose who you want to vote for, for. You have a right to choose if you want to go to hell or not, or if you want to go to heaven. It's your right. God gave it to you. He gave you all kinds of rights. So you need to make that decision, and it's your choice on what you choose. In Titus 3, 5, it says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. It's not by my works. It's not by everything I I do or try to do. It's not, you know, you guys know I love to shop for ambassadors, and I love to volunteer with them, and I love to help, and I love to serve. But that's not going to get me into heaven. You know, that's not going to save me. I can be the most giving person and do the most volunteer hours and do the most good deeds, but that's not getting me to heaven. You know, it's not by works. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus came down, he was perfect, he he was without, without sin. But when he went to the cross, all of the sins of the whole world was put upon him to be satisfied so that we might be made the righteousness of God because of him. You have to have a relationship with Jesus. And you think about it, you know, people out there trying to do good, self-righteous, I'm, you know. God's righteousness is so much better and better in quality than you could ever, ever imagine or do for yourself. Once you receive Jesus, then you become the righteousness of God. You can't get any more righteous than that than you are right now in Jesus. You can't improve on that. It's from him. Because in Isaiah 64, 6, it talks about we are all an unclean thing and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf. You know, but with his righteousness... That doesn't happen. We are able to approach God now. Before, we couldn't do that. 
you know, we weren't seen. We were seen as like this filthy rag. But with his righteousness, we can now boldly walk to the throne of God and be like, hey, Dad, I, I need help with this. Or, Dad, you know, because that's what he is to us. He's our dad. As a little child, a lot of you ran to your dad when you needed something or you needed help with something. You called out to your dad. That's what he is there for now. And we have the right. We can boldly go to his throne. You know, in this world, you know, you look at royalty and families. You know, you can't just walk into the palace and walk up to the king and be like, hey, king, how's it going? With God, we can do that. You know, the king of kings, the king of everything, the most high, we have the right and we can boldly go to his throne, sit down at his feet, jump in his lap, hug on him, give him a kiss on the cheek, and he accepts us because he's given us his righteousness. You know, um, trying to earn your salvation by doing all these good deeds, you know, doesn't get you that and doesn't get you his righteousness. In 1 John 4.10, he says, And this is love, not that we love God, but he loved us and he sent his son. So we can accomplish all this because he sent his son to satisfy all of our sins, to take all of the penalty against us. So let's move on to number five, redeemed. We need to be delivered because we're in captivity. Christ paid a ransom or price for our freedom, and we are no longer in captive. So we needed to be released from the curse of the law, the guilt of sin, and the power of sin. We were held, and some of us may still be being held captive by the devil. And we are slaves to him because our sin enslaves us to him, to the devil. So we need to be set free. So Christ paid the ransom. In Galatians 3, 13 through 14, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, everyone who hangs on a tree, curses everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. You know, how many, how many wants the blessings of Abraham? I mean, we, want, we should be able to walk in blessing. Walk in kingdom blessing. Walk in kingdom health. Um, so, kind of struggling a little bit because I'm having a hard time seeing my papers. So, <laughs> I take my glasses off and I can read my papers just fine. But some of you way back there in the back are a little bit blurry. So, I put my glasses on. I can see you guys, but my paper is a little bit blurry. So why don't you say, well, just go to the eye doctor, Diane. Well, I did. I went to the eye doctor yesterday. I'm sitting there, and she's looking at me. I'm explaining what's going on. She goes, okay. She looks at my eyes. She examined my eyes. She goes, huh, this is interesting. I'm like, okay, what, what's, like, oh, my gosh. When the doctor says, oh, this is interesting, something kind of weird and odd, like, oh, my gosh, I know, oh gosh, here I go down that rabbit hole again. You guys know how I love rabbit holes, and I go down them thinking, okay, something's wrong with my eye. What's going on? Okay, so, okay, I know this eye surgeon and this eye surgeon, so when I leave here, I'm going to call. I already had myself scheduled for eye surgery. That's, I mean, in like 10 seconds. That's how bad I go down the rabbit hole. But he, she goes, no, she goes, your eyesight has improved. Praise God. Praise God. You know what I think it is? We are all getting to the point where we are going to be walking in kingdom health. Kingdom health. We're going to be walking in kingdom health. Everyone in this building should have no ailments, should have no pain, because we all are walking in kingdom health. We're walking in kingdom wealth and kingdom health. Because, you know what? I just, I'm just here visiting did you all know that I'm not from here? That I'm not, a, I'm not from America? I am from heaven. I am a citizen of heaven. And I am just here for a short time visiting. But my home is in heaven. You know, one day I'll return home. Pastor Dave, 
that little little scoundrel rascal. Such a punk. He beat us there. He's up there. Yeah, I'm, I'm home. I'm home. One day we'll be home. That is if you make the choice and you choose to go to heaven as your home. So now that I'm got to tell you about my eyes, Christ, okay, Romans 3, 23 and 24, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Justification, we've been justified, is a gift. You don't have to earn it. He's just giving it to you. So Romans 8, 1, there, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So I don't want to walk after the carnal side of life. I don't want to, I don't want to go to work and try to do things so that they like me and they accept me. And I, you know, we're going to go out partying after work, Diane. You want to come? I want to be a part of their group. I want to be accepted. I'm not going after that. I'm following after the spirit. I want to follow after the spirit of God, this Holy Spirit, the spirit of Christ. That's where I want to go. Now, it might not get me, you know, popularity votes, but that's okay. Would I rather be popular with people down here on earth? Or would I rather be popular <laughs> with, with Jesus and the Spirit and my Heavenly Father and, you know, the angels and be over here? That's what I want to do. I want to follow after the Spirit and walk after the Spirit and not the flesh. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. No amount of money in the whole world could ever ransom you for what you owe and get you, set you free from the devil. There's no amount of money that you can pay the devil to ransom your soul. There's no amount of gold, silver, nothing that can do that. For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God and your body and your spirit, which are God's. So my mind, my body, my soul, my spirit, all are God's. I was bought for a price. He redeemed me. So I... In a sense, I don't have any rights because God bought me. I belong to God. He has what is best for me in my life and my future. So, you know, a couple more things. For, you know, there's so many things he did when he died on the cross. But um, dying on the cross, and number six, he defeated the powers of darkness. So when the powers of darkness are defeated, I can have peace. And I want the peace of God to rule in my heart. You know, in Colossians 3.15, it says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. So I'm thankful, you know, he died on that cross to take away those darkness. In Colossians 2.13 and 14, And you, being dead in your trespasses, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that were against us, which was contrary to us. He has taken it out of the way, nailed it to the cross. Okay, so when I read that, I think of this. Police officer got me pulled over. He's writing out all these things I did wrong. Whole list of tickets. So here in life, you know, you lied. You schemed. You did this, you know, you stole. You cheated. You, you know, all these things. So I take my ticket, I handed it over to God, he took it and he nailed it to the cross with his son. He paid for everything, everything. And the Passionist says, this realm of death describes our former state, for we were held in sin's grasp, but now we've been resurrected out of that realm of death, never to return for we are forever alive and forgiven for, of all our sins. He canceled out every legal violation we had on record, and the old arrest warrant that stood to indict us 
He erased it all. Our sins, our stained soul, he deleted it all, and they cannot be retrieved. Everything we once were in Adam has been placed onto his cross and now permanently there as a public display of cancellation. So we need to be a public display of cancellation. We need to be the display, walk in his righteousness, walk giving him glory, giving him praise, giving him thanks for what he's done for us. We are that public display, and we need to portray what Christ has done for us in this world. Because if we don't do it, who's going to do it? If we don't portray what Christ has done for us, and that he died for everyone, and that he loves everyone, then who's going to do it? It's our job. We've been called to do that. And number seven, I'm going to end with this part. He had to go to the Father so he could send us the helper. Why did Jesus have to leave us? He had to because he would, would have not been able to send the Holy Spirit to every believer around the world at the same time. The Spirit was with him. So if he didn't leave, then if he's here with us here physically, then the Holy Spirit is here with us. But the Holy Spirit wouldn't be with the believers elsewhere. Does that make sense? It took me a moment to get this. I read it over and over again. He had to go to heaven so he could send the Holy Spirit so to every believer around the world at the same time. Jesus would have been at one place at a time so the Holy Spirit would have been there. But he had to go out so he had to go up so the Holy Spirit would go out. Jesus went up and the Spirit went out. John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For I do not, if, if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Um, so I was praying on this, and I was, you know, reading it and asking God for, I need a revelation here. So he sent me some different, sent me to some different places. And I found this one thing, and how it was portrayed, and I just love this. So when you ask Christ into your heart to save you, and you believe on him, the Holy Spirit comes to you. But the way, so when I was saved as a young child in the Baptist church, I had the Holy Spirit. I just didn't know it, and I didn't know what to do with it because they didn't teach that. It wasn't until after Tim and I got married that I got filled with the Holy Spirit. And um, so... Or the Holy Spirit was activated in me, I guess I should say. So I had the Spirit, but didn't know what to do with it. So think of it as you have a huge house, and you have all this money, and you got a butler, okay? And this is, from, this is how Wendell Parr explained it, and I loved it. Someone knocks at the door. The butler answers the door. Yes, you're here to see Diane? Okay, yes. Come on in, and they take, take them to the sitting room, and they sit down. Now, have I received that guest yet? But that guest is in my house, right? But I haven't received that guest yet. It's not until I come and I receive that guest. Oh, welcome, Holy Spirit. I'm so glad you came to see me. Until I acknowledge it and accept them into the house and interact, they're there, but they're not doing anything. Think of the Holy Spirit like that. There, but we got to activate the Holy Spirit. You have to activate the Holy Spirit. You have to want the Holy Spirit to be a part of you. You have to be like, okay, Holy Spirit, I see you. You're here. Let's get busy. Let's do something. Let's change the world. It's up to you then to use the Holy Spirit. It's a gift that's given to you, but you've got to take it. You've got to accept it. You've got to use it, and you've got to work with it. So in John 14, 16 through 17, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you, and I will be in you. So I love the Amplified Bible, how it says this, starting at verse 5. It says, but now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts and taken complete possession of them. 
But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For I do, if I do not go away, the helper, the comforter, advocate, intercessor, counselor, strengthener, standby, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him, the Holy Spirit, to you, to be in close fellowship with you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world about the guilt of sin and the need for a savior and about righteousness and about judgment, about sin and the true nature of it because they do not believe in me and my message about righteousness, personal integrity, and godly character because I am going to my Father and you will no longer see me about judgment because the ruler of this world, Satan, has been judged and condemned. I have many more things to say to you but you cannot bear to hear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth, the full and complete truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but he will speak whatever he hears from the Father regarding the Son. And he will disclose to you what is to come in the future. He will glorify and honor me because he, the Holy Spirit, will take from what is mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Because of this, I said that he, the Spirit, will take from what is mine and reveal it to you. I just love that. He's a comforter, the advocate, intercessor, counselor, strengthener, standby. So, if you are not filled with the Holy Spirit, it is a gift from God. And you can have the Holy Spirit because he died on the cross for us. So he died not only to heal us, he died not only for our sins, he died so that we didn't have to do the wrath of God. He died so because we were kept captive and he paid the ransom. He died for so many reasons. And he gives us gifts. He died for us and he gives us gifts, the Holy Spirit. So, and he's, he's your counselor. You know, a lot of people go see a counselor, and there's nothing wrong with that. Counselors are amazing. I have um, a relative, a friend, and, like, they all go to the counselor. And that's, you know, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, you know. And they're spending, you know, this one girl at work, they were spending, like, $1,500 a month for all of them to go to counselor, like, once or twice a week. I was like, oh, okay. I go, yeah, I go to a counselor, too. I have my own counselor. She goes, really? You, you go to a counselor? I go, yeah, I have a counselor. Um, but mine doesn't cost that much. Well, how much is your copay? I go, I don't have a copay. What kind of insurance do you have? Oh, the same insurance you have through work. Well, how did you get it for free? I go, because my counselor is the king of kings. He gives me the Holy Spirit. I can go to him anytime I want to when I have a need, when I have an issue, when I have a concern, I have a trouble. I go to him, and he counsels me and directs me when I listen to him. So, but I have seen a counselor before in life, and they are amazing. They are amazing. They've helped me through a lot of things, you know. But God will direct your feet, and God will direct your path, you know. And we're going to get to that point, like I said earlier, we're going to walk in kingdom health. We're going to walk in kingdom wealth, because that's what the church is about, and that's what God wants for his church and for his people. So, in conclusion, if you're not filled with the whole, well, first let's go back. If you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, if you don't know right now, without a shadow of a doubt, that you're going to heaven, and you want to receive Christ as your personal Savior, this is the time to do it. Please don't hesitate. Please don't hesitate. So if that is you, when we do the altar call, please come up, and we'll have people up here, if the altar team wants to come up, we'll have people up here who will pray with you and lead you to Christ, and you can accept Christ as your personal Savior. And then, and then you'll have me as your sister in Christ, and you can call me your crazy sister because I'm called Crazy Aunt Diane, Crazy Mama D, Crazy, just crazy. But that's fine. I'll be your crazy sister in Christ. Come up, receive Christ. 
know for no without a shadow of a doubt that when you die you're going to heaven because it scares me to think that any of you would be going to the other place I don't want anybody going there nobody nobody second if you are and you don't have the Holy Spirit and you don't feel like you're filled with the Holy Spirit and you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit come up to the altar too we can pray for you with that because let me tell you the power of the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues you know when I study the Bible God speaks to me so much more when I have the Holy Spirit just guides me and directs me and I have new revelation every time I read a verse so the Holy Spirit is your comforter is your friend gives you strength someone to stand by you you're never alone you know they say when two or more are gathered he's in the presence well I've got that I've got me Jesus and the Holy Spirit I've got three and God he comes in and joins too so there's four of us so I always have somebody with me so if you all will stand and we'll do an altar call and come down and uh, can you play that just play that one song to start off the altar so yep altar team come up and I'm just gonna Lord I just want to thank you father for this day I pray that this word has touched someone's heart right now father that their heart they're under conviction father you give them the strength you give them the boldness to come up and to turn their life over to you and to get that spirit father I just thank you father I give you the glory and honor and I thank you father that I was able to deliver this word that you had me do in Jesus name amen so come on down